Hello everyone, my name is Victor Röhman, and today I'm here to talk about the latest environment I had a chance to work on, World of Warcraft's Orgrimmar. I've played this game for more hours than I can count when I was in my teens, and it's what got me into working with 3D. Being able to give it a proper homage was an opportunity that I just couldn't let pass. The goal of this video is to give you a broader overview of how this project was made, what the main challenges were, and why working on environments that speak to you on a personal level truly matters. So as I mentioned in the intro, I'll be giving you a high level breakdown of this environment. So if you like this type of format, please let us know in the comments, and also please let us know if you have any suggestions, and we'll definitely keep that in mind for the future. So what really got me inspired to make this, other than being a horde player at heart, was the recent release of WoW Classic, or World of Warcraft Classic. I got incredibly inspired to work on something fantasy related, which was a big challenge as I mainly work on sci-fi and contemporary stuff normally. And what was challenging wasn't the genre itself, but rather the style and design language. And as you know, WoW has a really distinct style, and I wanted to respect that, while also making it look more realistic. So let's take a look at the concept so that you can see what I had to work with. Here's a collage of concepts that I used for this project, but if we take a look in the top left corner here, you'll see the main concept that started this whole thing off. And I absolutely love it, and it truly feels like Ogumar, but it is very basic and bare bones. The structural elements are very chunky and stylized, just like the game itself, but that wasn't gonna give me all the information that I needed, so I had to look for more concepts. Now with easier said than done though, I had to grab some screenshots from in-game, but those were obviously also very stylized. They did provide me with some context and information regarding to the terrain and the materials, etc. But what I did then was I started looking at fan art and shots from the Warcraft movie. And Ogrimmar isn't in that one, but there's a lot of shots of orcish architecture, which I relied quite heavily on. And then, about 3 quarters or 75% into the project, the latest cinematic from World of Warcraft was released, and they actually showed Ogrimmar in that one. And it was incredible to see just how many similarities there are between my version and their version. I think we used the same concept. I knew I wanted to keep the layout of the original concept, with the roads and the paths and so on. And that I also wanted to do a really early version of it before Durotar, the area in which Orgrimmar is, was transformed by years of being trampled and built upon. So a bit more lush, meaning some more dead trees and so on, and rugged, in other words. Going back to the style for a moment, this was the part of the production that gave me the hardest time actually. I wanted to retain the WoW aesthetic, but without having the assets look hand-painted and too diffuse heavy. I wanted a realistic spin on it, but not photoreal. And you can see what I mean by looking at the screen here. So what I ended up doing was something in between. I decided to aim for a painterly look, as in the general composition, the lighting, and the grading, instead of having the assets themselves looking painterly. I ended up looking at Renaissance paintings, as they generally have a lot of motion and drama in them, and also the colors you generally find in them fit the scene really well. And as you can see here in the construction time lapse, I hit the composition of the concept really early on, and the architecture and shapes evolved from their original design more towards a realistic style, with a high level of exaggeration and strong design language. Scale was also a really tricky aspect, because the wall is huge, but having it look the part wasn't easy. I decided to work with the wooden elements in the original design and create scaffolding, which not only helps with scale, but also helps tell the story I wanted to tell about this being a really early version of Orgrimmar, still being built. If we focus in a bit on the towers here, which I think is a great example of the evolution of the style that I landed on, you can see how I really tried to push the shapes hard. And this is something that I really struggle with, and that I'm trying to get better at. It's so important to turn things up to 11 initially, 
which then lets you dial it back as needed, instead of the other way around, because it's so much easier to remove than it is to add. And this bit me a bit in the behind, as I had to do a lot of iterations before I got happy with them, and each iteration being more exaggerated than the previous one. And this brings me to the next point, positive and negative details. In this composition, which is backlit and needed a high level of recognizable shapes, it was incredibly important to work with silhouettes and positive shapes. You'll have to excuse my poor attempt at drawing, I'm a 3D artist for a reason. What I'm showing here is an example of positive shapes, or the silhouette, if you will. It's easy to get lost in the negative details, or the details within the positive shapes. Without good, positive details, all those negative details are just noise. Just compare these two examples. And I think we can all agree that the one on the right side is the more recognizable shape. As for the natural elements, or the terrain, that was actually the easy part and that ended up in a really nice spot early on. So what I did was I created the block out in Maya that I then used as the actual ground, and as a base for dressing the cliffs. I just used a couple of 3D rocks from the Megascans library, and I used them to dress the block out with. In order to blend the cliffs together nicely, I used the World Align texture. I'll be going into detail on how that works in the upcoming livestream, which will also be saved to our YouTube channel so that you can watch it anytime you want. Before we get too caught up in the technical details that I'll go over later, I want to move on to the lighting. This was something else that I got figured out pretty early on. As I mentioned previously, I wanted to go with a backlit setup, just like in the concept. And this worked great, however, it presented me with a bunch of challenges. Working in the shade is, at least in my experience, really tricky, as you have a lot less light to work with, which goes without saying. One of the challenges was separation, and there are several things that I wanted to stand out, such as the huts, the towers, the road, fences, and so on. And I did play with the idea of actually rotating the sun, so that would be hitting the gate instead. It just didn't have the same dramatic effect though, as you can see. Instead what I did was I started using fill lights, both to do light painting with colors, but also to cast some fake sunlight onto certain parts, such as rim lights on the towers, the roofs, some extra light on the road, and so on. I also tinted the skylight a bit to an orange color to have it simulate the effect of the sun bouncing light on the sandy ground. Overall, the creative process was really iterative for this project, and I made a lot of decisions and changes along the way. You can see some of the changes I made on screen here for things like the towers going from more of a masonry heavy style to more of a timber heavy construction. This decision really started a chain reaction, causing me to rethink all the architecture really. And when working with environments, regardless of scale, I always recommend documenting progress shots continuously. Not only does it make decision making easier, as you can compare easily, but it also helps as a good motivator, being able to see progress clearly. At least for me. And the biggest thing I learned from this is what I mentioned previously. Just step it up to 11 initially. Don't tread carefully one step at a time. Just go all the way and cut back as needed. Even though I was the only artist working on the project, I can't take all the credit. During the whole process I had the privilege of receiving fantastic feedback, suggestions and critique from the art team I work with. And even if you don't have a team you work with, make sure to utilize the power of the internet. Forums such as Polycount, Facebook, groups such as the Quixel Art Community or Twitter are all fantastic places where people love to help you and your art grow. It can hurt, but you don't grow without some growing pains. For the finalization of the scene, I started refining the post-process settings for things like bloom, grain, chromatic aberrations, vignetting, and so on, and also the color lookup table. So color lookup tables, for those of you who don't know, uh, or LUTs or LUTs for short, is a really intuitive and easy way of grading your scenes. Do keep in mind that it doesn't work in the high dynamic range, but rather in the low dynamic range, so it has its limitations. The way it works is that you simply bring a screenshot into Photoshop, you apply some adjustment layers, adjust the colors and so on, then you load the color lookup table reference from 
the Epic website. You save it out and load it in engine. Then you simply plug it into your camera or post process volume and you should have a pretty much one-to-one -one result in engine. It's as simple as that. One question that I get for pretty much all my projects is how I make my renders look nice and sharp. And it's actually really simple. The top left of the viewport, you can see an arrow. There you can open up the high resolution screenshot tool. And I like to render out shots either at two to three times the target resolution. Then I just go into Photoshop, scale it down to the target resolution and apply an unsharp mask. And that's it for this video. I truly hope you enjoy this new format. We make these videos for you guys, so we'd love your feedback so we can become better and give you the learning material that you want and need. So please leave a comment below and don't forget to tune in to the upcoming live stream where I'll be covering the details and specific techniques I use to create this scene. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.